Now the next topic is surgical management of acute stroke. My speaker is Dr. Daljit Singh. Sir, I would like to invite you on the dais. And chairperson here, Dr. Hemant Bharatiya, sir, Dr. V.D. Sinha, sir. Please come on the stage, sir. I would like to invite Dr. Sushil Tapadia, sir, for presenting a bouquet to the chairperson and speaker. So, welcome Dr. Daljit Singh for this very special meeting. And uh, Dr. Daljit Singh is head of the Department of Neurosurgery, GV Panth Hospital, New Delhi. And uh, he has uh, awarded so many awards, but, but important award is B0 Award for uh, in Neurosciences. He was given this very prestigious award. And uh, he was treasurer of uh, our biggest neurosurgical association of India. And, uh, he has a lot of publication, more than 200 publications. His main uh, field of interest is vascular. So welcome Dr. Daljit Singh to this prestigious meeting and his presentation is surgical management of acute stroke. Dr. Daljit Singh, please. On. Is it on? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sinha, for that. Uh, Introduction. And I'll also like to express my gratitude to Dr. Tapadia and Dr. Sukta for extending the invitation. I've been hearing the, with all passion the talks given by previous speakers on various aspects of the stroke management. And the topic which has been assigned to me was acute surgical emergency, the role of neurosurgeon. So, first of all, you know. Majority of the surgeons or the neurosurgeon in particular, two things cross through your head. Stroke means intracerebral hematoma or maybe an infarct, and what is uh, classically being done. Hematoma means hematoma evacuation and uh, infarction being decompressive phenomenon. Believe me, as a surgeon, there is much more to offer beyond these two specified topics of uh, general interest. And what are those? Uh, areas before I go on to that because time is limited I'll be only touching on to the briefly about what they are and maybe a little bit more about these two entities because they still form the basis of neurosurgical interventions. Now let us understand what a neurosurgeons can do in various acute stroke conditions. You have hematoma, hematoma evacuation. You may have aneurysm, which can be clipping or coiling in emergency. You have pure intraventricular hemorrhages, which will be drained or efficient. There can be dural AV fistula can present with an acute stroke, embolization or emergency ligation. Major veno-occlusive condition, some revascularization procedure, including the thrombolysis and stenting. Then for ischemic strokes, we have emergencies with CEA, carotid endotectomy, embolectomy in the mid-cerebral artery, emergency bypass procedures, and of course, decompressive craniotomy or craniotomy. And both of these conditions can lead to hydrocephalus for which we can help you out for efficient and This itself will constitute the two days of discussions if we go minutely in each aspect of it. But then thank you for giving me this topic because it also brings up the you know, insight in the mind of uh, neurosurgeons that their requirement is far, far more than what normally it is being practiced in various institutions. Briefly about, I was reading about the global burden of the stroke in the World Stroke Organization. It was an eye-opening statement. There are about 12.2 million new stroke cases. That's very important. 
one in four people over the age of 25 will have a stroke in their life. It was a very, very scary statement when I read it recently, and it has just come in 2021. That was very scary. And uh, also was important was approximately 16% are young stroke between the age group of 15 to 49. Huge death, six and a half million people die through stroke annually. And uh, also was important that females are equally affected with the stroke these days, what was believed to be a male dominance area. That's also changing and there may be various uh, reasons and of all, Intracerebral hemorrhage are approximately 28% of all kind of the stroke globally. Now let us see the statistics in the United States. It says there are approximately 8 lakh cases per year. It's more common in Black and Mexican American and low and the middle income groups. That's constantly being seen all over the world and as high as 40% mortality on spot. That's very important. We do not have a definite Indian statistics available. There are various reports talking variously because we know the reasons why we are locked. So let's touch some of these aspects. You all know spontaneous intracerebral hematoma, common sites and all. So what? We all manage them every day, medical management, surgical management, doing nothing. Now, when it comes to the role of surgery, I think it's very imperative for us to understand what all it produces. Beside direct pressure, it also sets in biochemical toxicity of the blood product in and around the core of the hematoma, producing hemoglobin, thrombin, free radicals, scavengers, free radicals uh, there. It adds on to its all toxicity, increases edema, increases ICP, and there is some element of uh, uh, inflammation also. So it is not just a direct pressure, there is a huge cascade of several things which are happening in a patient who has formed a large hematoma. What else it can do? Hematoma can expand, that's very important, and there can be scissors and sometimes the fever can be because of this also. Now, what matters in assessment of hematoma, of course, is the GCS score. Volume, generally quoted is 30 and 30 centimeters above and below. This is the scale which is being followed. Whether there is an intraventricular extension or not, or whether there is a combination of intraventricular extension along with intracerebral hematoma. Location, whether it is supratentorial, infratentorial, and age. Cutoff has been given in the literature as 80. According to me, there should be a different age group also. When it comes to predicting hematoma in a patient who has come with a stroke, there are various scales available, PSAM, which we all say, Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Rosiers, none of them have been found can clearly distinguish between an ischemic and intracerebral hematoma without the help of any radiological investigation. Now, which are the people who are at the high risk of developing intracerebral hematoma? Now, current understanding is that there is an element of arteriosclerosis, which is also known as lipohyalinosis. It produces a deep intracerebral hematoma, that is thalamic region. And amyloid angiopathy usually will produce lower intracerebral hematoma. But the clue is that beside age, high BP, diabetes, anticoagulant, antithrombotic agent, there are telltale signs in the angiogram which can tell you this potential this patient is a potential risk for bleeding. And these are cerebral microbleed and cortical superficial cirrhosis. What are these? Now look at this. If you can see this image, CSF is appearing slightly white. And look at this, CSF is black. This is cirrhosis. And very often, we tend to ignore these observations while we are seeing the patient for some other reasons. These become an important observation because you can forecast such a patient more so if it's a hypertensive, is a potential candidate for development of the intracerebral hematoma subsequently. And similarly, microbleeds. Look at this. These are the black dots, which can be often may be labeled as infarct. But the sequence changes, it is bleeding. And then these are again two categories of the patient who are at a risk of developing intracerebral hematoma subsequently. Now, I thought I'll inform those at least for the resident or the junior faculty to know about it. 
Now, 2022, recently, a couple of months back, there have been guidelines for the management of the patient with spontaneous intracerebral hematoma. These have come from American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, and have been adopted by the various associations as well. Now, I will like you to just go, to be familiar with this. It's a big, beautifully, freely available article. Those who are interested in strokes and stroke type thing must read it in details to be understand, but I'm just giving you a passing reference. These are 10 basic guidelines which 2022 is giving regarding the hematomas. Now, the first guideline is, key component of this is the initial evaluation of the hematoma score and transfer to the facilities where the neurocritical care and neurosurgical facility exists. My previous speaker has emphasized the role of neuro rehabilitation, and that has also become an important guidelines about this. So that they say is a far most important class one recommendation that you must identify those cases and refer to the center where all facilities exist in one. Second is identifications of a predictor of hematoma expansion, hypertensive hematoma we are talking of or spontaneous. Now, there are telltale signs on scans that decide clinical deterioration that the patient may deteriorate uh, based upon the CT scan or observation finding. And what are those? Those signs are irregular margins, surrounding hypodensities, spot sign on the contrast scan, heterogeneous densities within the hematoma, Fluid levels, swirls, black hole satellite sign. I mean, there are many, many of these signs which can be there in the image, which can tell you this patient is likely to deteriorate. And I agree, literature says MRI is definitely better than the CT scan in predicting all this. Now, let me tell you some of these. Now, this is the hematoma in the temporal lobe. Contrast extravasation is showing the spots like this. This is the spot sign. Now, this is an indicator the hematoma is likely to further progress and hence be careful about the progression. Now, very important thing is how to calculate the size of a hematoma because that helps you making the decision. Classically, is the longitudinal axis and length followed by the perpendicular or that level, A, B, and C is the number of sections in which it is available. Divided by two is the classical uh, method which is being followed, and this is for the resident to understand. Let me show some cases. Some of our case, small hematoma, you see there is a dot over here, enlarging. It is slightly hyperdense on one side and hypodense, slightly hypodense on the other side. From all probabilities, looks like patients should settle down and all, but then these are the warning picture. This is not a uniform white picture which is being seen. That means it's this patient can deteriorate and exactly happen three days down the line, the picture has changed significantly. So the awareness of the conditions or the scans which can be a predictor of hematoma growth can be, shall be known. And that is the third guideline, the guideline, hematoma expansion makes the worst prognosis, obviously so. Definite sets of vascular pathologies are there and but there is a need to be aware of those expansion guidelines also. Now, next important thing as a neurosurgeon, I think uh, if there are neurosurgeons sitting in this uh, uh, meeting, I mean, we as a surgeon are very tempted to remove the hematoma. Fine, good, that's good, and we are supposed to do it. But the racing guidelines are focused on acute reduction of the blood pressure in these patients. There, there was a time when we as a resident were very afraid of bringing down the pressure. Now it says this is important that one has to bring down the BP. It, it not only that, it has been found it reduces the mortality, it further decreases the size of the hematoma expansion. And there are various studies in which, by which these conclusions have been derived. Uh, BP control, there is a level one recommendation in patient over the spontaneous hematoma. It is recommended to prevent intracerebral hemorrhages by reducing the BP. Uh, there are various methods uh, by various ways of reducing the BPs. Will not time will not permit me to touch upon them. Then also any other important area is acute reversal of uh, anticoagulants which patient has taken, and that's very important observation. All uh, these greens are level of uh, uh, recommendations, class of recommendations, and that is one which says. Efforts should be made to revert the 
coagulation by whichever methods are available or even the aspirin things should be given what are those methods available again they prevent ex uh, hematoma expansion facilitate surgery like by using vitamin k four factor prothrombin concentrate fpp for uh, uh, 10a uh, i don't know whether this is available and extend alpha uh, idrasizumab and even so much so that the charcoal can be given to these patients orally if the drugs have been taken within say 2 to 3 hours of the presentation that is what is part of the recommendations also and of course even for heparin induced hematoma protamine shall be given now this has become a part of the uh, recommendation same is patient has taken aspirin use ffp desmopressin is also available now and uh, that is for emergency surgery and it says for elective surgery platelet transfusion should be avoided it is more harmful this is a very clear cut indication which has come up now so that's another one now we also practice several in house therapies like steroid hyperosmolar therapy uh, uh, stocking for dvt prophylaxis uh, anti epileptic drug control of temperature glucose these are uh, being practiced the recommendations are of a moderate kind and does not have much of a, a role same is the statin steroid now let's come to the surgery now most of the surgical recommendations are based upon misty free and enrich trial as per the literature and uh, the aim it has been pointed now very important thing for us to understand is a surgeon surgery will always be compared with the best medical result in three aspects in terms of mortality whether it is better or not in terms of functional recovery okay that's that's an important parameter and all surgeries which are being done are now being compared with that so so let's see one each one of them now the literature says minimally invasive surgery that is endoscopic or stereotactic evacu evacuation results in better functional outcome for a gcs between 5 to 12 and the clot size is between 20 to 30 that is a recommendation now what it does not answer what the gap is the timing of the surgery is not clear meaning thereby at what stage of the detection of a clot it should be removed because has the clot actually stabilized or if you have removed the clot what is the risk of it formation again after the surgery so those are the gaps which it still not addressing the role uh, the presence of intraventricular hematoma it says intraventricular hematoma may be as high 30 to 50% 50% of these may produce hydrocephalus it says for gcs more than 3 evd alone will work and evd is a evd with intraventricular thrombolysis is safe although the functional outcome may not be as desirous as could be just adding on to the improvement in mortality i will skip that now next come the role of evd with intraventricular uh, thrombolysis it says that when the blood is present in the third and the fourth ventricular and there is a hydrocephalus uh, irrigation with alteplase or urokinase improves the survival and decreases the chances of development of uh, hydrocephalus now then we come to craniotomy and craniectomy for intracerebral hematoma this trial most of the neurosurgeons are uh, familiar with it it improves the uh, mortality but then again not much of improvement in uh, functional outcome and the gap remains when exactly should be operated upon i think there cannot be universal guideline it has to be guided with an individual uh, cases in itself now craniectomy now craniectomy means i hope most of the people understand the difference between the craniotomy and craniectomy the bone flap is removed from the uh, skull it becomes craniectomy now decompressive craniectomy in intracerebral hematoma not in an infarction with or without hematoma evacuation improves the mortality but the functional outcome again remains uncertain okay and it is recommended for gcs less than 8 that was between 5 to 12 less than 8 and again more than 30 cc now very clear recommendation class 1 is craniotomy for posterior fossa hemorrhage there was a time when we were forbidden to do craniotomy for posterior fossa hematoma kuch nahi ho sakta patient will not survive don't do anything now it is class 1 recommendation it should be done hematoma should be removed or maybe you can club it with the decompressive craniectomy also 
Having said that, there are other issues as a neurosurgeon or a team has to know is that when and how to stop the uh, life support treatment. Okay, I mean that one says that this is a part of the 10 recommendation one should discuss with the family when to stop it. Rehabilitation has been very finely discussed by the predecessors. Rehabilitation with the coordinated input multidisciplinary team should be started as early within 24 hours. One should not wait once the patient will be discharged. Patient is in-house, the physiotherapy and all those types of things should be started as early as the patient within 24 hours. And the last guideline is the role of the home caregiver. Psychological education, practical support, training of the patient, activity, quality of life, these are the guide, part of the guideline which has started coming up and so is the rehabilitation, neurobehavioral analysis. So that is about uh, hematoma. Now what else is, up, uh, is in the basket of neurosurgery? Emergency, carotid and artery. Now the debate between the stent and the carotid and artery would remain. Can we do emergency carotid and artery? Answer is certainly yes. It's a technical thing. Those who are doing elective carotid and our techniques, emergency carotid and our techniques can be done. And I'm personally aware of many places across the world. It is a norm to do emergency carotid and our techniques also. Then uh, let's jump to the ischemic stroke. Now, ischemic strokes, uh, uh, decompressive craniotomy, craniotomy. I mean, we. Our experience of neurosurgeon in decompressive connectomy is based upon our experience in traumatic brain injury primary. Okay, it saves life, there is functional recovery, and uh, but there are ethical issues in saving a life and producing somebody who is hemiplegic and dependent on the family at the expense uh, of uh, uh, state uh, care. I mean, those are the issues which are also being debated in these patients. But then what is the evidence? In patients, Decompressive conductivity for the supratentorial, it says uh, it is good, it should be done and uh, as early as possible, uh, guided by the patient neurological condition. Cerebellar infarction, again, like cerebellar hematoma, cerebellar infarction recommendation is absolutely green. It should be done without thinking much about it. It should be taken as early as possible. Some examples like uh, there are various types of decompressive phenectomy being performed. There are at least eight types of decompressive phenectomy being performed. The size of the phenectomy to be done, how to preserve the bone flap, single phenectomy versus multiple type of phenectomy, unilateral, bilateral, four flap, six flap, inch flap. Uh, these are various types of available. And interestingly, like uh, this is our cases recently, she's still admitted with me. We did it recently. These were all, already multiple fragments of decompressive craniectomy was done. Bone was preserved in the bone bank and we used, uh, you know, these are the uh, titanium clips for which the fusions has been uh, done for the bone. Again, in 2021, there is an international survey on decompressive craniectomy, international survey practice. Now, it was conducted all over the world. These are upper uh, uh, income group and middle and lower income groups uh, uh, statistics. Multinational 60 countries have participated in this study and it was found these are various types of uh, decompressive phenectomy being done. And it says this free bone flap uh, craniectomy pieces with being put back onto the bone without putting in the abdomen is possibly most practiced uh, decompressive craniectomy as on today. There are issues with the decompressive craniotomy. There can be sunken bone flap. There are hydrostatic pressure difference between the atmosphere and the brain. So those are the different set of uh, topics which can be discussed there. Now let's talk about emergency bypass. Now we heard Shakir, we heard some of the other speakers also. And Shakir was very honest. Incidentally, honesty is that he and me are the same batch. So you all heard. Mechanical thrombectomy devices being taken when it's trying to push away the thrombus. First bypass success rate is not more than 40% in most of the cases. In 60% of the cases, one would land up into three, four, or five bypasses to be able to retrieve that thrombus. And believe me, every time there is a defragmentation of the thrombus and thrombus goes distant. Almost 100%, there will be no exception. 
whether it produces a neurological deficit or not or what kind of deficit other than motor sensory or the language is being produced because of the mechanical thrombectomy are we producing micro infarcts in these patient because of the shower of thrombo thromboembolic sequences which are happening remains a matter of concerns and maybe there is a significant cognitive impairment in these patient which would required maybe later on assessment of this so can we do emergency mechanical opening of the middle sebal artery and remove the thrombus from this answer is yes okay now we do endovascular procedure regularly we have had instances where the thrombus has formed along with the migrated coil we open it up okay give protamine heparin is going on neutralize the effect so do it and then uh, i take an out unfortunately surgeons are little scared of doing this procedure for an obvious reason There's less of exposure. Maybe they we need a little bit more exposure and confidence to be able to safely remove that thrombus with one proximal clip, another distal clip. Open the artery, remove the thrombus, and that's it. Believe me, just requires a little bit more uh, exposure and to be able to do it. I'll conclude by saying that surgeons have much more to offer in stock than ever before. I have already listed them. they should train themselves with all the aspects of the surgical management to save a life and improve functional outcome and beside managing surgeries issues related to control of the blood pressure coagulation and other things i think all surgeons should be familiar with in order to produce much better result than making a, a stitch and removing the hematoma or a piece of the bone from the patient. thank you so much for your listening thank you dr daljit singh for very comprehensive surgical management of stroke as such i was thinking you will be showing some fascinating clipping you will be showing some fascinating surgical videos but you have uh just the theoretical yes the more of theoretical aspect plus the stroke more of ischemic stroke type of thing because i was thinking to have the basic uh, for the practitioners i do not know and the residents here and many things we learned the advanced thing here so what i was thinking when we were taught about the stroke when we were doing our mch those who are practicing general practitioners and the residents that how do you diagnose a case of stroke whether it is a ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke one simple thing used to be said that if it is painful then it is hemorrhagic stroke and if it is painless by and large it would be ischemic stroke so at the periphery when you are treat if the patient has severe pain so most likely must be having hemorrhage so you can that was the teaching still it is that you, when you if you hesitate in giving aspirin if you are not able to diagnose also you can still give aspirin in in the peripheral centers and that's how and mostly the strokes ischemic strokes by and large out number the hemorrhagic stroke by means like 80% or above would be ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke would be less just i wanted to have uh, we have time dr suresh gupta that you said the irrigation by the endoscope of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage by saline or uropanis when we started you know endoscopy in india we were the few people in the in india who started endoscopic surgery and we used to do a lot of uh, irrigation of intraventricular but then at the time i think uh, we gave up because maybe the results were not very encouraging or uh, we did not find that to be very fruitful so no, what now is it your has become a part of recommendation i mean initially we were scared of using now it is becoming a part of you know recommendation So you, so you still recommend that you still do the irrigation. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I was. It is now becoming a part of recommendation. Okay. And 
about uh, in what cases uh, you do ECIC bypass as an emergency procedure? That's a difficult question. See, I do not have my personal experience of emergency ECIC by bypass. Okay, for stroke we are talking about. We're talk just talking about stroke. But then uh, literature does mention the emergency bypasses uh, in uh, uh, acute lacerations of uh, the vessels where you cannot do anything. One has to do, take a clip and do some bypass. People have done for the giant aneurysms also emergency bypasses. Uh, uh, thrombus which is showering repeatedly, soft thrombus which is showering, people have done it. What the importance is not to impress upon when. I mean, these are the options available. And if these options are available, maybe in due course of time, we will be having a better answer, which will be the cases where you can do an emergency bypass. So to complete the list that has been added up, I'm not suggesting you start doing it for uh, as a routine. Yeah, with the master sitting here, Mr. Dr. Jackie Wilson, Dr. Singhal, and uh, others with and uh, Dr. Pilochan, our interventional has so much advanced that maybe that this uh, thinking of learning bypass and then practicing would be more you know, dangerous than so, the assignment or the, yes, the uh, will have the something. open floor and <laughs> Ms. Dr. Zakir Hussain would like to say something. Mike. I think the topic of uh, yeah, extracranial intracranial bypass in acute stroke is a very, a very new subject. The study that we have uh, quoted is from Zurich, actually. Yes. Uh, a few cases, I, I know yes. it's a particular uh, eight cases that we have done. So it's a very consensus decision for going for these, uh, these uh, intervention. So all of these cases were our rejects, all the eight cases that has been reported by this uh, Luca group, is uh, the, the rejection by the internationalists are the based on the decision that uh, there are technical complexity and this relative safety of the procedure is not available. So in that regard, we will say we will keep our hands away. So in those circumstances, these are some cases which are also demanding a alternative way of, you know, revascularization. So these were under a very strict research protocol. They are being done. Where we also performed the old, uh, uh, old study and NOVA study, and uh, then subject them to research. So it's a it's a pilot project. It is not a uh, I would say a established thing, but it's a comeback. ECIC bypasses, which were abandoned for a long time. So maybe in the future, there would be a sub subset of cases which will have an implication for ECIC bypasses. What literature says is the failed endovascular procedures can be an indication for emergency bypass results. Yes, that that's, is what that's all also one, one uh, uh, point, basically. But uh, in this eight cases, all of the cases which are discussed and preemptively decided that they go for research. So you work in the such an excellent FX Institute of India. So just I want to know uh, for better neural functioning, you can experience with stem cell transplantation, neuromodulation, or cortical stimulation therapy. Sorry, I have not understood. Uh, for, uh, for better recovery of neural functioning, post stroke, yes. post surgery. Do you have any experience uh, of the this is stem cell transplantation, stem cell. neuromodulation, and cortical? Sorry, Dr. Sina, I have no experience of the stem cell. And uh, I mean, although I'm not a master of this, but whatever little bit understanding I, I have about the stem cell, I have used stem cells for spinal cord injuries, OK, not for the stroke. I don't think there is any room. That is whatever my understanding is. I'll, I'm not an expert, but then there is. No role of stem cell. I mean, it is being marketed like anything, but I am not convinced as on today to be able to deliver. With say, even that's the reason I have not even touched that about. Okay, now it is being used for each and every indications. The stem cell is being used, 
but there is no science behind it which will actually explain it. We used in the spinal cord injury transactions in autologous bone marrow transplant to use it. Even then, our results are not good, so we start not started recommending. So do have experience in that. I have done uh, omentopexis for the brain also in uh, strokes. Okay, I mean we have done it about eight to ten cases of uh, omentum transplanted into the brain. Results were not good, so we have given it up. So that that's it. I have no experience of uh, stem cell. If someone has it or somebody wants to say, please do mention about it. If someone has any little experience. So if we don't have any question, then we conclude this session. It has always been a pleasure to. Listen to Dr. Daljit Singh. He has a wonderful voice and wonderful talks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would uh, request Dr. Hemant Bharti, sir, and Dr. Vidhi Sinha, sir, to present a memento to, to Dr. Daljit. Sir. Thank you, sir.